I'm Zach Abbott. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Zbiotics, which is based here in San Francisco, and hoping today to talk to you about how cool startups are and kind of a really great opportunity they are for somebody with microbiology training, uh, especially right now. Um, so just some quick facts about me and Zbiotics, just to give you uh, an idea where I'm coming from. Um, I have a PhD in microbiology from University of Michigan, and I started Zbiotics about three years ago, and it was just an idea at that time, um, not based on research I did in my PhD or anything like that. In the last three years, um, we've raised a little over $3 million. We have five employees, um, and uh, we are launching uh, next month. I'm really excited. So we make uh, genetically engineered probiotics, and the idea is that they make enzymes that are useful inside of your body. And so our first product that we're launching makes an enzyme that breaks down acetaldehyde, which is a known toxic byproduct of drinking alcohol that makes you feel terrible the next day. So next month. Get ready for it. Um, all right, so I'm going to talk to you today, though, about startups and kind of why I think they're a really good opportunity. Um, so there are many good reasons to start a startup, but I'm going to focus on four today, uh, which is that there's a lot of funding available. This is kind of the new normal in terms of um, private sector innovation. This is how private sector is innovating, is through startups as opposed to doing in-house. Um, there's a very high probability of success with a startup, uh, contrary to kind of popular belief, depending on how you define a, uh, success. And uh, it gives you the opportunity to pursue your passions and genuinely have a positive impact on the world, which I think are all really great reasons. So let's talk about funding first. Um, if you look at the amount of money that startups have raised last year and you compare that to how much money the NIH is investing in academic uh, research, it's basically comparable. So Synbio Startups raised uh, $4 billion last year, which is that's money in their pocket um, is the same uh, as NIAID funding and all NIH is just a little bit more than um, all biotech startups put together. But the difference being that biotech startup funding is doubling every year or increasing you know, massively each year, as opposed to NIH funding, which is you know, not increasing at that level. So uh, there's also a, small fall of, a smaller pool of applicants for the startup money than there are for NIH funding. So funding is booming right now, basically, um, in the biotech world in particular. Um, and then, as I said, it's sort of the new normal for, for uh, Innovation, uh, big companies, rather than investing in their own R&D in their relatively narrow kind of area of expertise, they're kind of you know, betting on several different startups who are all kind of innovating on the cutting edge and trying out new things and taking risk on themselves, and then basically kind of cherry picking the ones that succeed. And so from that perspective, there are, you know, like for instance last year, $8 billion in corporate back funding of startups. Um, and they do that through accelerators and grants and funding and equity and all kinds of things. And so. Um, this is really the way that innovation is happening in the biotech world right now is startups. And then looking at success. Um, so it's commonly thought of that's, that startups are risky. Um, but in reality, if you compare it to academia, it's actually far more safe. So the success rate for uh, an R01 equivalent is about 20% according to the NIH. Um, and so the lifetime of an R01 grant is five years maximum. And if you look at a five-year survival rate of a startup, which means that they have funding to survive for five years, that success rate is 50%. So it's two and a half times better than, uh, than academia. Uh, and then if you actually look at the a positive return on investment for that startup, so if they exit and they make money rather than lose it, over the whole lifetime, that's 40%. So that's a very high success rate, uh, relatively speaking. Um, so you know, if you define success as billion dollar exit, yeah, then it's you know, not, not, not the easiest thing in the world. But if you define it as just surviving and making money, then uh, you, know, you can go for a really long time. It's a very high success rate. Um, and then kind of the huge potential for innovation and change um, in the startup world. I mean, so uh, Impossible Foods, and they make an Impossible Burger, so if you don't know, they engineered yeast to make essentially a soy fo form of uh, hemoglobin called, uh, like hemoglobin, and it, they basically make veggie burgers that bleed, is how they describe it, and it's something that's capturing people's imaginations, and so there's an Impossible Whopper at Burger King, there's an Impossible Slider at White Castle, and people really want this, uh, but what they're really doing is they're innovating, and they're creating something that benefits the world, it uses an, uh, you know, an order of magnitude less resources and creates an order of magnitude less greenhouse gases than meat. Um, and so it's having a positive impact on the world. It's also having a positive impact on people's perceptions around GMOs and genetic engineering, which is really impressive, right? And so similarly, Modern Meadow, they, make, they use yeast to make leather. Uh, and this is a picture of, uh, of uh, a leather shirt uh, at MoMA in New York. And so this is capturing people's attention. It's really uh, exciting, but it's also really practical and amazing. Um, and so, this is a bunch of other startups in the, in the synthetic biology space that I love. They're amazing. I'd love to tell you about them all, but I only got like 10 minutes here. 
uh, but just, you know, Pivot Bio is using microbes to replace nitrogen fertilizer. Novo Nutrients and Mango Materials are literally turning pollution into usable man and valuable materials. Um, Clara Foods is using yeast to make egg uh, albumin instead of using the chicken. So the space for innovation is incredible. Uh, I mean, these are just pinpricks, right, in the space that we can do with microbiology. Um, so, you know, from this, I hope you see that there's a lot of funding. This is a really common thing to do, and, like, the space is wide open. So now I'm sure everybody here really wants to start a startup. So uh, how do we do that? Um, it's super complicated. Uh, it's basically have an idea, uh, evaluate the market opportunity for the idea, and then get funding, um, which should sound familiar to you. Um, it's very similar to being a scientist, right? So you have this hypothesis that you generate, right? And then you go out and you gather data about that hypothesis. You see what people have done, uh, you know, what the state of the field is, and determine if there's an opportunity to pursue that question. And then if you th think that there is, then you go out and you get funding. Um, and so really, the skills you acquire as a PhD scientist are super valuable in the world of entrepreneurship. Basically, uh, if you look at kind of all the things that you have to do, and, you, and you know, I can tell you from kind of standing in the room at a pitch competition or in front of an investor, um, the kind of critical thinking and, and, uh, and, and fielding questions and challenging uh, kind of, or overcoming challenges uh, is really important uh, for success. And, most entrepreneurs don't have formal training in that, but you know, you as a microbiologist have gotten that level of training, and so that really gives you a leg up. And not to mention the fact that that PhD gives you an, a level of credibility that many entrepreneurs don't have, um, and, and it really gives you a leg up uh, for funding as well. And so, for all those reasons, scientists make excellent entrepreneurs, um, and so the skills you're gathering are super valuable, um, and will make you very competitive in a place where there's a lot of money to do great things. The idea with a startup is a lot of times it's just kind of like, you know, I don't know how to do all this stuff. Like, what about equity? And, you know, what do, what do I, uh, you know, what do I have to worry about? And, and, you know, mostly you just kind of go out and do it and you learn as you go, like with anything. Like, think about how you started your PhD thesis. You didn't, like, figure out all five years worth of experiments and know everything up front, right? You had a hypothesis, you dove in, and it probably changed a lot throughout the time you've been in your PhD. And it's kind of the same thing with the, with the startup. You kind of just dive in, uh, just get going and, you learn a lot of stuff as you go. Um, you don't stop being a scientist and really have a 360 view of, of where you want to go, but let the details kind of work out as you go. And so kind of what can you do to set yourself up to, to kind of do a career in startups or entrepreneurship? Um, and honestly, I think this is good advice for uh, any scientist, not just as one who wants to be an entrepreneur, is always be pitching. Always uh, be refining your talk or refining the way that you talk about your science, that to really try and fire people up about what you're doing, right? If you are talking to your mom or your friend or whatever about what you're working on and their eyes start to gloss over, it doesn't mean that they're dumb and you're smart. It means that you're not communicating effectively. And really, it's all about getting people excited about what you're doing and figuring out the way to connect with that person. And that's super valuable as an entrepreneur, right? That I started Zbiotics with an idea and I walked into investor meetings and told people, this is my great idea and I now give me money, and right, I had to really get people excited, and that's kind of what you have to do, but it's also true for any form of science, right? If you want people to be excited about what you're doing and you want uh, you know, to have an impact with that research, it really is, uh, the most important thing you can do is practice really communicating effectively and connecting with the person you're talking to about your science. Um, so with that, I just want to leave uh, kind of one final thought, um, which is sort of this very complicated graph of all the things that could happen during a startup. Um, so you could either, you start this startup and you can fail, um, and then who cares? Because, you know, you failed and nobody really noticed. And so I actually take comfort in that, right? Like if it doesn't go well, nobody really saw you by definition. Um, but then if you succeed, uh, you can change the world. And I know that might sound hyperbolic, but I mean, just picture the idea that if your startup did well, necessarily people know about what you did and they ch it changed the way they thought. Like if you think about something like Facebook, which seems really frivolous, on the surface when it started, right? Completely changed the world, right? Impossible Burger is changing the way people think about, about food. Um, and so, you know, if you picture what you're doing when you start and how you want that to positively affect the world, um, you know, you can really start to guide that communication. Um, so for Zbiotics, you know, we genetically engineer probiotics and we start with something kind of, you know, frivolous, right? We start with something that people deal with kind of on a normal everyday basis, but the idea is that we get to engage with the consumer about genetic engineering. And our goal is that by changing their perception of our product, 
we can change the perception of the technology and change policy and change regulation in a positive way, right? And it's a small stair step, but you know, that's the power of, of startups is that by definition, you're trying to change the way people think. And I think that's a really exciting thing to be able to do. Um, so yeah, that's, that's my pitch for startups. Uh, I hope uh, you all are inspired and, and maybe think about what you might start someday. Thanks. Hi, what organism are you using for, for your uh, uh, al al alcohol dehydrogenase, yeah, uh, your acid uh, aldehyde dehydrogenase enzyme? We use uh, b -satilis. Oh, on my skin. The FDA doesn't call that a drug and require all the hurdles, of um, bugs so, as drugs? Yeah, so I mean with our product, I mean because it's a probiotic bacteria you already eat and expresses an enzyme, we make a genetic argument and the FDA, as long as you don't make health claims, is comfortable with that, yeah. So you did your PhD in Michigan, and yeah. now your startup is here in San Francisco. Correct. Um, so how about location? Does location matter for funding? That's a really great question. And unfortunately, the answer is yes, it does, I think. Uh, it's not that you can't raise in other places. That's not true at all. Uh, but it certainly is a heck of a lot easier in the city uh, or in the Bay. Um, so I didn't move here exclusively for that reason, but I was advised by um, a mentor at Michigan um, when I was there that I would have a lot easier time coming out here and and he was absolutely right um, that being said you can do it from anywhere in fact my first funding came while I was in Miami uh, so I, after Michigan I was moved down to Miami and that's actually where technically Zebiotics was conceived um, and uh, I, I received my first funding from there so it's not impossible to raise and people do it um, there are definitely hubs that make it a lot easier and unfortunately, particularly in the Bay, there is a bit of bias. It's, 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 it's starting to go away, but there is some bias for Bay Area companies. So I do think the location does matter. Great talk and congratulations on your success. Ah, so okay. uh, can you recommend any resources that list investors who are more willing to make investments in microbiology or science? So I think there's a lot of it's a good question, and there's a lot of um, stuff that's starting. So if you go on like Crunchbase or AngelList or things like that, and you sort of look and see what uh, investors are listed for certain biotech companies, that's always a good way to kind of get started. The truth is, and this is actually this actually brings up a really good point about uh, microbiology startups, is that that one of the great opportunities that's happening right now is that a lot of investors who haven't traditionally invested in biotech. Are, are seeing the power of this technology and, and all the success that companies like Impossible are having, and they're starting to invest, and they actually don't know so much about it. And so you kind of get the opportunity to be like, hey, like I can be your first test. And, uh, and, and it's actually been the world of, of investment is opening up for startups right now. And so I think that uh, investors who didn't traditionally used to do it are starting to. And do you know of any incubator programs or anything particular for science? Uh, um, so there are, there are a lot popping up, and uh, I don't know them all. But so for instance, we did Y Combinator, oh. um, which is not a traditional biotech incubator, but it was great for us. Um, there's Indie Bio in the Bay as well. is really great. And um, there are a few others. Uh, if you wanted to talk to me after, I can kind of brainstorm more. Yeah. Thank you. Cool. Thanks a lot.